start the continuous auditing theorization, I want to ask you to tell me, in your view or in your thoughts, why and what is a continuous audit? Why do you need a, a more continuous audit? Yeah, so there is a sequence of events, and you're saying that if you can limit the event at the beginning, it costs you less money. And actually, that's kind of the quality thing that a lot of people do discuss about. Quality of systems is basically not having errors or having errors detecting them. What, what else? Why else? Yes. More frequent process and uh, maybe in a little bit more technical way, somewhat automated or using automation, maybe that's better. Okay, but that's even more than that. That's not only auditing, that's kind of financial, real-time financial report, correct? So it's associated with, well, I'm going to use some acronyms, continuous reporting, continuous monitoring, continuous assurance of all. Continuous reporting, monitoring, and all. Now, before anyone starts saying something different, this is a figment of my imagination, okay? Companies are not doing conti fully continuous auditing today. Companies are not monitoring everything. Continuous are not, companies are not continuous reporting. However, they are doing more continuous reporting, more continuous monitoring, and more continuous auditing. And what are the reasons besides the pebble of Michael, which is really kind of a quality. What are the reasons companies are doing this? So you are talking about the problems of latency, delay, correct? And you are saying that latency costs you money. Remember, we, when we talked about real-time economy, we saw... Go ahead, go ahead. You want to add value as soon as you can. But remember, when we talked about uh, latency reduction, we talked about decreasing the time to perform. Occupation of capital was the main argument. And then the argument with inter-process latency reduction was basically we decrease the errors that you generate by entering things with, with hand. And then decision latency is more his argument. Yeah, his argument <coughs> of let's decrease uh, let's decrease the cost of sitting on something which you could do right now. So it's really kind of a, <coughs> a cost. So here we go to the next one. <coughs> we just these are data capture type of things, or automation type of things. <coughs> Sensoring or sensing is automatically capturing transactions. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means instead of someone entering the transaction, it's sent somewhere. Now, can you give me some examples? We already went to this to real-time economy. Um, uh, but let's recap. Tell me some ways the transactions or events get sent. Yes. Say again. Inventory. And how do you do that? Okay. So we are talking about RFID, or it could be real barcodes and and the scan. Okay. For example, you could have pieces, let's say boxes being assembled with a barcode in the side and a scanner in the side looking at it. So it doesn't have to be active RFID sending you a signal. It could be a more manual type of thing. But yes, well, what other ways are uh, uh, automatic collection of transactions? Yes. Okay, so they were, what they were sensing at that moment is the weight. Okay, so that th this was a dimensional measurement. They probably had what is the, num the the box going by, and now they associate the weighting to it. And you know, this could be 
to verify if the shipping is correct, but could be also to know how much stamp to put in that, that thing, how much to pay for it. Yeah. See the car there. Yeah. Of course, more advanced would be if it look, you have those hanging tags, it would pick up your signal there and charge it directly to your car and give you a ticket if you over for $25. You know, that would be all this. Hey, uh, we are going to start doing this. I'm going to say this technology comes in. Tell me how would you lose it, use it further? Extend your imagination. And start thinking about things like hotels versus renting rooms in private residences. Start thinking about sharing cars. Start thinking about zip cars. Start thinking about leasing your laptop out for hour per minute per second. Okay, these are all things that couldn't be done practically in the past, but they are starting to happen because the technology to manage this existence is cheap. So it's just a question of in your having an idea. Those guys that, that are doing rental space, uh, there are whole whole set of things that are picking up rooms in your apartment and, and and pretending that that's a hotel room and renting it out and doing ratings and et cetera, et cetera. Oh, those guys are making a bundle of money because they had this idea of using a particular resource that wasn't being used. And what's also happening is the established laws and established organizations are biting back. You think the hotels like the fact that Oksana can rent out two rooms in her, in her apartment at one-tenth of the price, maybe better than the Fleabag Hotel that was trying to sell it? You think that uh, uh, you think that the taxi companies like the fact that you can haul a cab with your uh, with your cell phone? You know the taxi cabs in New York City carry a medallion, and the medallion are worth anything between seven hundred thousand dollars and a million. So when you take a taxi, you are not paying for the car or the driver; you are paying interest to the owner of the medallion. What is the sense of that? This is a sense, you know, 100 years ago was good to make sure that the car wasn't built and the driver was not a mother. But today, this doesn't make sense, but it's still there. Okay, so these kind of additional usages of existing technology are very rich. And that's where this generation is going to make their money. It's not by going work for Procter Gamble or for Deloitte or for PwC. The big money making, although being a partner is good, the probabilities of making a partner is much less than one. It's very good to be a CPA firm. In six years, you make the double of your salary. In other six years, you double it again. That's pretty good. Correct? But multiplied by the expected value of you being there, then the the real money, the present value of that current money flow doesn't look too good. Why is your expected value of being there very low? Are they going to fire you? Why? Maybe that's one reason. Uh, the main reason you are going to leave is that their hours are unhuman. Correct? And uh, if you are a Japanese job worker is expected. You go there early in the morning and leave until midnight and your wife takes care of your family, you never see them. Not anymore, but you see them. Uh, but now it's not acceptable. In your culture is not acceptable, this kind of thing. But you know, this is kind of ridiculous. My son is a financial analyst, correct? And he worked for Bank of America Security. His boss had no call at three o'clock in the afternoon of a Sunday to send him to the office, and he sat there for an hour waiting until the, the boss called. The boss didn't come in, he was playing golf, okay? And so he had worked seven days a week, pretty much 15, 16 hours a day, and the culture was such that he couldn't be the first to leave. So he stayed there, had nothing to do, but he stayed there. Okay, and fingers going like that, sounds familiar. She, he now has another job. He's now a buy-side analyst for a fund. Okay, maybe, maybe 30 investment professionals, they manage $20 billion. Wow. Ah. So in average, they manage approximately a billion dollars each one of them. He's an analyst, so he's not really in the management side. And he thinks the hours are very civilized, from 7 to 7. Seldom, maybe once every 
week or two, he works until a little bit late. Now, this is all relative, correct? I was talking with, uh, with, uh, with Anthony and William at the, at the event, and they were saying, well, four months I went, I go home at midnight. Well, that's why people leave, correct? Yes or no? Yeah. So the expected value is limited. And what I was trying to do is transmit a little bit of information I had, because you are going to be in the reporting stage very right? soon. Uh, uh, well, what you did mention is the moment you buy something on e-commerce, you actually are sensing it, correct? Because you chose what it is, you press the button, at that moment say, I just sold such and such. So that goes to accounts receivable, goes to clearance or credit cards, whatever the way you pay. Okay. At the same time, instructions to inventory, instructions to shipping, you can match those things electronically with no problem. Uh, so there is substantial increase of automatic collection of data. Uh, and then the ERPs. Remember, I always draw the ERP as a circle with little circles around it. And what I say, this is a relational database, and the things around it are different applications, like human resources, intellectual property, accounting, finance, etc., etc. Hopefully, one of these days there'll be an auditing application there, but we, it's not there yet. They have kind of auditing layers, but they don't, know. They don't do the job. Okay, and so this is another form of automation because in old days you enter the data in every stage that you were. Now you enter data in one place and put it in the back. I, my first job after I got my PhD was at the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. Oops. And I, in addition, started an MBA program. I ran the large computer center, largest in North America, definitely. And we implemented systems for the university. So bursar's office, meaning payments, registrar's office, meaning curriculum vita, et cetera, et cetera. And when we started integrating into an ERP that we acquired, we found that about 40% of the people that were registered were not paid because they were separate systems. It turns out that there was a father, a very saintly, very saintly man that waved everyone from tuition. Okay, and so when I showed the list to my boss, who was a Hungarian Jesuit, he went crazy. And so they spent all night arguing in the, in the Jesuit residence there, and the next morning they set up a committee that they went one by one. And then let's stand up Brazil and say, This guy has a car, how can he not pay his tuition? Kind of having a car was a big deal. Isn't it? Okay. Uh, but was because the system was discovered. You know what else we found? We found that around 10% of the people that were paying were not registered. Actually, what turned out to be mainly was girls that got married and changed names. And the names were not updated. The updating system was real clever. Okay. Uh, it turned out also there were some people that were not getting academic credit. Okay, we also have an exception to the So when you go from with this file system to the integrated ERPs, you come up with a lot of variation, but from there on, you enter data once. And that's very good. Um, so the, these were kind of the main facilitators of automation. And we did this project uh, from 1986 to 1991 in Bell Laboratories. The laboratories was a research arm of AT&T. At that time, in 86, was the largest research institution in the world. They had 8,000 people working with PhDs out of around 20,000. The budget was $4 billion. They gave you transistors. Do you know what a transistor is? Big Bang Theory, integrated circuits, everything that you use in telephony originally started there. Okay. Great research institution. Um, uh, and when I started working there, uh, I came from Colombia. I took a year off from Colombia and went there, and I loved it, so I stayed there. Okay, it was great. Uh, was, uh, Colombia was the only guy doing computers. 
at Bell Labs, everyone was like me, PhDs in physics and mathematics, playing with computers. And at that time, at Bell Labs, 86, 85 actually, I was here there, in 85, they were already doing sensors. They were collecting telephone calls automatically with what they call electromechanical switches. So one hour after phone call, there was a one hour cycle. In one hour, they downloaded all the calls. Then they started collecting again, then downloaded again. There was no manual intervention, except those tapes that they downloaded, they physically shipped them to Dallas. And now and then, they lost it. So sometimes your phone calls were not charged because they lost the tape, okay? And because they lost big data volumes transmitting was difficult. Um, but what we started that, is, and there was this myth in at and that about 30% of the calls were never charged. So we ran this project, and the objective of the project was finding out if we're charging everything we should. And after a couple of years of of analysis, we found out that yes, pretty much everything was being charged, maybe a loss of two or three percent for different reasons. Have you ever heard of blue boxes? Blue box is a little device that makes click, click, click. And this blue box the same noise as a as a coin being dropped. Famous. And so Yeah, 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 yeah. And so what you did is you you could talk for free on the telephone. That time was expensive call talking the phone. Actually, the other day I saw a young lady about your age asking an older guy, how, how do you use a payphone? She never had used a payphone. I just couldn't believe it. I asked her. I said, you know, how do you use a payphone? And I never used it. Okay. Uh, uh, but anyway, these things have little blue boxes that made a noise. So you press the button on the box and made a quarter noise. And, the other, and that's the way that actually the machines transmitted the information to the central switch to allow the phone calls to be made in payment. But that was basically the, the reason for the loss. The other area that wasn't explained, you love this, is there were certain phone calls we were not allowed to collect. And they were kind of CIA calls and etc. So they paid a bulk amount of money with an estimate of calls and you could not register them. Okay, so they were the only two things. Anything else was pretty much dead. Incomplete calls and etc. And what we did, we tapped the network in several different places. Actually, we had around 60 collection points and wrote equations to figure out how many transactions were really going through there and what was the average duration and etc. And but that was kind of the operational side of the story. The auditing side of the story <coughs> was that we came out with this idea of continuous auditing transactions and have, at that time, ongoing monitoring. Okay, uh, they asked me to talk to you a little bit about the issues presentation. Okay, uh, most important thing of the issue presentation is being interesting to the audience, correct? More than anything else. Meaning, if it's a great presentation but it's tremendously boring, your boss will not appreciate it. Correct? So, it, that thing. Don't try to cram too many slides on the presentation. The presentation, I think, is 25 minutes. So, there are five people, each one gets five minutes. Okay? Um, and everyone should present. And you are not waiting, your grading is non, not on your screen on your uh, speaker skills and etc. Speaker skills is basically to teach you how to do this. And uh, if I notice things, I'm going to call you aside, not usually in front of you, and say, try not to put your hand in your mouth, or turn your back, back to the audience, or faint during the presentation, or something like that. Or I'll give, I'll give tips, like uh, if you are very nervous, read as opposed to talking. And I never advise to read, but if you're nervous enough reading, it's good. And so we're, we're, uh, individual presentation is one of the, the learnings you get. But the, the grading and evaluation will be on your ability to make it interesting, to choose what you are going to present reasonably well, to create a coordinated presentation, and will be my very, very um, qualitative evaluation if you learn something doing it.
Okay? Now, if you are doing anything that you have a little bit difficulty finding information, send me an email. Because I have easily hundreds of uh, former presentations by groups on many of the topics. I was just talking with the uh, 3D printing group here that will be presenting earlier. I said, just send me an email, I'll send you some materials that I have. Okay? And you know, you, you don't repeat someone else's presentation, but you can learn a little bit from it. Okay, and and don't uh, don't get too nervous about this. It's a, it's a class exercise. It's not a job thing, or whatever. Okay, um, but you know, some very basic things. Speaking clearly is important. Uh, speaking to the level of the audience is very important. I'll follow that. Okay, uh, understand. Trying to understand. You know, it's always good to think what I want to transmit. Okay, very important, meaning uh, what, uh, when I leave, should the people that are not texting learn what? Okay, if they're testing, not, nothing you can do unless uh, you can do any radiation that the, the moment you text, the, the cell phone explodes on your hand or something like that. So, uh, besides that technology, I, I don't think you can do very much. But uh, for the people that are paying attention, what they can learn, you don't want them bored. Uh, you want them to leave having learned something. And you know, the thing like 3D printing, uh, Internet of Things, wearables, uh, rent your car, rent apartments, uh, think rest, uh, you know, social media type of stuff. I think that's people from everyone. And people see that and say, ah, oh, that's good. Uh, or, ooh, I'm going to, when I, I'm going to Paris and I'm going to save myself some money. Or I'm going to find a girlfriend or something like that. Okay, and it's, it's worth. You know, I had a presentation last year or two years ago, Jew, Jewish dating. I said, oh, Jesus, what's coming? Actually, it was great. It was great. She had a very good set of ideas, and uh, she had examples of friends and found husbands, and, and it was really very good. Very good. And so uh, it's okay. There are people that uh, uh, just kind of learn something. It's important that this is my audience, this is what I want to learn. You know, if it's something very cool, like uh, a new web book, say, just people need to know that this thing exists, how to use it, what can we do for it. Okay? Uh, social media. You know, I had a couple of presentations, social media and privacy. And uh, these, this group pulled together a series of examples of dysfunctional privacy consequences. Things that you divulge about yourself that you really shouldn't, that could be bad for your employment, and it was a very interesting discussion. And one of the group actually went to Facebook and showed how to control the privacy. And you know, Facebook has been very criticized of it, and they have improved it. But it's still very intricate to protect your privacy with Facebook. Um, and you know, actually what they start saying, you really want privacy, don't use Facebook. Uh, that's what they started. And then they kind of showed how to. Okay, it was a very good presentation. I think uh, several people are taking avidly notes because they use Facebook and they want to protect themselves. So th that's about the issues. Is, and you know, it, interesting topic is good. And I'm discussing with, with a group here. And, um, you know, I made a list of topics. But doesn't mean that you have to use that list. Okay, find some interesting topic, do it. I'm certainly be ma very cooperative on this. I'm interested. You know, I, I rather not have a rather obscene topics. I prefer not because it might be a dean coming in and getting upset. But besides that, I I actually am very happy with uh, with very large variety. I, I had some guy in my classes, and he was an oceanographer before, and he made a presentation about ocean. And he, they done research, and I said, what's coming from this? And actually, it was extremely intelligent and interesting, and people learned a lot about diving and about, uh, and you know, I'm a diver, I dive uh, 10, 12 days a, a year. And uh, you know, I went to very nice diving places. And I learned a lot about, uh, about the world and about, uh, about technology being used in this. And that's the objective here, is to give you a, a wider range range of technological experiences and learning and make the people a little bit of maybe I can make some money out of this. Making money is okay.
That's why you're in business school. Okay. Um, okay. So we are talking about about CA, and we are talking about the AT and T, and we talked about this acronym: continuous reporting, continuous monitor, continuous audit. And we said that the facilitation of this real-time economy comes from these things. And then I started this continuous auditing. I'm going to continue the, the story. I said that within at and actually, uh, I joined at and in 85 as a visiting scholar from, Bel from Colombia. And uh, when I was there, I knew the CFO, a guy called Bob Kavner. And uh, Bob, uh, Bob uh, said, oh, we had no lab. So, why don't you have a look at the internal audit organization? And I was already busy at that moment doing the architecture study for their model on system. They had like 46 general ledgers. They had about 100 billion. So, uh, and we did a kind of six-stage plan, kind of homogenizing and reducing the, the variance. And the company had about 350,000 employees at that time. Uh, Fifteen years later, they had 30,000 employees. Because the markets, the long distance market, the cost of the first phone call was going down. They had to do that. And at that time, they never really enforced architecture reduction. Ten years later, when they had to, were ready to go bust, if they, something wasn't going to happen, they actually reduced. They called the, the project called the concept of one. And the concept of one was one biller, one general ledger, et cetera, et cetera. And they reduced it down. But usually, companies don't change their systems or their architecture unless it's a dramatic situation. But at the same time, I started talking to audit. So I went, I, there were about 350 internal auditors at AT&T. And I started talking to them what they were doing, and et cetera, et cetera. And they came out with three recommendations. And the first recommendation was, you know, get some computers. You want to have computers. And uh, software, and use PCs, and et cetera. This is 85. Okay, and the first IBM PC came out in '82. The Apple Watch had been around for four years at that time. Okay, and my second recommendation uh, was related to these very large systems they had, and the bigger system was this biller called the Arcan Biller, and it was basically the strategy. Uh, AT&T in '84 divested. What does that mean? The courts forced AT&T to get rid. Uh, stop being a monopoly. So AT&T kept the long distance business and Verizon, Bell South, SBC were all created. So there were uh, AT&T and the Seven Dwarfs. And uh, basically the, the wording for them was uh, you are in a competitive business, they are going to be a monopolistic local bi telephone business. Uh, when they start competing, they'll lose their monopoly. So progressively, SBC, Bell South started trying to go into the long distance business, and at and even suffered worse competition. So th that was basically the story behind the reduction of at and But at that time, they were still very big, and they had this entire audit organization. They actually had a, a computer company called Convergent Technology. They're selling PCs. And what happened is when they divested, they gave up the switches. The switches went with operating companies. And basically, the network at AT&T was the United States. And there were 142 switches. And they were interconnected. And these switches collected the telephone calls. So you called someone, you registered that phone call. And basically, when you made a call from here to here, it's routed on the line, the telephone call to here, and then distributed this on what they call the local loop, which is the local telephone network, uh, even these days still common. Okay, so that's the way that the thing worked. Uh, but they lost contact then because they lost the switches. So they needed to do something. What they did is call what is called is the game back. And the game back strategy was we are going to build separately. Instead of billing to the operating company, we're going to send our bills separately. So they created this system called RCAM, uh, Residential Customer Account Management. And this, uh, this system was to build directly. 
and so they could could have contact with the with the customer. They spent 1.2 billion dollars in 85-84 in the system. So I always used to say that company, telephone company sells you two things: telephone communication and billing. I think is very expensive. Uh, so I, I came to them and said, you know, you have this real problem. You don't have no idea what's happening in this bill, with, with, with this billing. And uh, no one really has a global view of this thing. It's a very big risk. And also, this is a real-time type of thing. You need to do some real-time monitoring of this thing. And that's why, and then there was the story going around that we're losing 30% of our billing. And this 30% of the billing could have been $30 billion at that time. A lot of money, correct? Um, turns out that they were not losing very much of that money, but we created this whole system of monitoring uh, the system. But the monitoring was several degrees removed because first a switch. You have a switch, let's say, in the airport, like why they have an airport. No one touches that. It's basically two computers side by side. If one fails, the other one takes it over. Okay, and the system engineers are very jealous of it. Why? Because if something fails, you know, you lose communication for the whole area. So they are very, very touchy about about the switches. And so what uh, what they do is every hour, two hours, depending on which one, they download the data to a tape and you transfer the tape. So we could never monitor here. We monitored when the tape arrived in the data center and we picked it up. The second thing, these things have databases, and these databases are very, very large for that period of time, and they are what they called at that time uh, hierarchical databases. What we use today is relational databases, and that time they were hierarchical databases. And the hierarchical database has, let's say, a root, a uh, main key, principal key, say your name or your social security number, and then other information about you, your address, the name of your mother, uh, your regular expenses, your last meals, etc. These things organized this way. So they're organized uh, in a hierarchical base, and you basically attack it by primary key. Okay? And so this was pretty clumsy, clumsy to do at that time. And the IT, there were four large data centers at at and and uh, the IT people there really didn't like auditors touching their data, with some justification, not too much, but some justification. So actually what we did, and the way they worked actually is that they had a data center, and they sent reports around, paper reports around, to the different users. But these were not paper reports, these were called RJE, Remote Job Entry Station. And these were like a uh, looks a little bit like a printer or a card reader. Have you ever seen a card reader? No, you never saw a card reader. Uh, maybe next class I'm going to show you some of these old equipment uh, slides of this. Uh, and basically what it did, it transferred electronic and the information from the data center to the RGE station, and then it printed it. So what we did, I think pretty creatively, we collected that electronic image of the printed report, and started using it. And we actually picked up the electronic image, was like a piece of paper here, and the word here, total. So I say capture this text mining in 85, capture the number next to total. And in the beginning was report ABC, collect the name of that report. So it's called the text mining, and you basically go to the characters to find the things that you want. It is a language in uh, Unix called awk, that's what we use. Okay. But very interesting, easy to understand architecture. I was distributing the data center, distributing thousands of reports across the nation. Reports get sent electronically to the printer. I collected just before the printer in the RGE station, pick up the piece of data, transform it in email, just put an address C on it, and send it to myself. Okay, send it to my son workstation. And so that report extracted and went to regular email. And this is 85, correct? Regular email was in that company. Well, when we started running this, we collapsed the mail system of Bell Labs. Literally, it crashed. 
because we're sending a special amount of five megabytes in the morning and 10 megabytes in the afternoon. That crashed the systems. Now, if I was any other company, I would get help. At Bell Labs, the engineer there in charge of that gateway said, took pride, said, this can't happen. I'll fix it. And he did fix it. In a, in a day, he had the thing working. And he did, then gave me help, said, you should have used uh, mail to mail protocol, you should use UCP, Unix, Unix communication protocol. So he, he wrote the script for me. I had written the script myself. Okay, uh, and uh, we, uh, we have five people working together. I was head of the team, and there were, was a physicist, a mathematician, one computer scientist, and one industrial engineer. Oh, and the one also one production. And, and so uh, we, we did our own programming, etc. <coughs> and so we collected these reports, extracted the data from it, put it into a relational database. And you'll see pictures of that <coughs> on this side. <coughs> but what we are doing is collecting day and night, day and night, information, comparing it exactly with the same time, against models. And if there was a big discrepancy between what we thought was going to happen and what would happen, we called an exception. And the exceptions were mailed or, or emailed to the relevant people. And we had four levels of exception with the different types of things. Uh, we done this in 85. I published this in 85 to 90. I published the first paper in 91. <coughs> Until around 99, there was very little interest. I presented this in the ICPA, in the IIA, etc. Et Some people thought it was interesting. Other people thought we were nuts. Okay, uh, but in '98, uh, Don Warren, who was a partner at uh, PwC at that time, uh, said, "You know, the CICA, the Canadian Institute, got interested on, on your papers, and uh, they are starting a committee on on continuous auditing." And uh, and so uh, Don, who was very influential with the ICPA, convinced the ICPA to join join the task force. So it was CICA, AICPA and invited me to be on the committee. So I participated. We wrote the thing, what we call the Red Book. And the Red Book was like the first statutory document on continuous audit, how to do continuous audit. Since then, in 2003, the Institute of Internal Auditors, IIA, published GTAG number three and now GTAG 16, giving guidance. And then Isaac, which is the IT Auditors Association, published in 2011, their guidance. And we are just in the process of writing what we call thick book, as opposed to red book. And uh, Paul is actually doing most of the writing. Uh, but it's committee effort, so chapter after chapter after chapter. And uh, that's the kind of AICP rewrite of the guidance. Now, that's kind of the story until 98. Actually, the red book came out in 99. And actually, in 2003, I get a call from Siemens and the head IT auditor of Siemens America. Siemens America is not a tiny company. It's a $25 billion company. Uh, said, you know, we have about uh, maybe 250 SAP facilities around the world. And we audit these things I want to have 18 months to do this. And that's not good enough. But, you know, it's very expensive and very difficult. Actually, they have an interesting philosophy. They don't use auditors to audit SAP. They hire SAP experts and they teach them audit. Why? Because it's easier to teach a computer guy to do some auditing than to teach an auditor to use SAP. And they created, they are called audit action sheets. They created this long set of about 300 sheets saying what you need to do in an audit. And basically, the, the auditors choose which one to use. And each one of the sheets is about 10, 10 actions. So extract data, do this, do that. Many of them are manuals, many of them are computerized. And so that's what SAP is. So they say, we don't quite know what to do because this is not working. Yet. And uh, his name is Ross Brennan. He's going to be our professor uh, in the last course, last semester. He's going to teach advanced auditing. Um, Unless he doesn't want to teach it, then I will teach it, but I think he will be teaching it. He's teaching this year. 
about doing it. Uh, but Tabat said, you know, what do we do? And he was doing actually a distance PhD thesis. It's a perfect topic for thesis. And so what we actually developed is the idea of lo looking at the baseline of control. So remember I talked about configurable controls before. And you have the, you have the hardware. Let's just use this, this guy here. Okay, around, this is your relational database. And around this, you have applications. And each application has a layer of controls. And these controls are configurable. Not all of them, but many of them. And so what the concern is that someone changed the configuration and left, left a lot of holes. The presupposition behind this is that if the controls are OK, the probability of any problem is less. So we actually, what we did, we basically created a baseline of controls. I say each one of these things should have these controls based on the audit action sheet. And then they wrote a program, we didn't do it, they wrote a program to extract the actuals, to extract actually what are the controls every night. And we compared this with this, this with this, to see if there was a variation. If there was a variation, we issued a little alert. Very simple idea. And it kind of worked over stages. In the first stage was only deterministic. What does that mean? If this is A, it's OK. If it's anything besides A, it's not OK. Later on, we did a second study where we actually had probabilistic and table lookups and etc. So we could verify more and more of the controls. In the first stage, in the first stage, we went to something like 25% of the controls are verifiable. And then in the second stage, we went up to like 62% of the controls are verifiable. So we did that. Okay, still there were 62%, there were 38% of the controls that were not verifiable. And what does that mean? Uh, controls or action sheets. We use action sheets as a basis. What does that mean is some of this uh, some of this action would be go and verify if there is documentation for XYZ. And you can't do that really automatically. Or at least not you can't do it smart. So we actually had this idea of going to the third stage where we would sit down with KPMG, who has their international, who has their auditors, and asking, do you really need this step? Do you need that step? Okay, can we do this in a way that automates it? Well, increase the probability of verification. 